It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betrayed. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilified. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross. Feeling forsaken by his father. Left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Keep going. <laughs> that was a great S.M. Lockridge. <clears throat> Would you bow with me as we pray? We are reminded, Father, that Friday came. The agony and the struggle of it. But here we stand. Sunday. It's a new day, a new hour. How we rejoice while we grieve for Friday. We glory in Sunday. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for allowing us to come to this place to honor you, to seek after you, to humble ourselves before you. We pray now, sweet Holy Spirit, that you would awaken us, speak to us all, and let this service forever be etched in our hearts and memories that Sunday has come for us. No longer bound by sin, 
but rejoicing because you live, we shall live as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We rejoice in you. We humble ourselves before you and pray your will be done today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. What a blessed day it is to be in the house of God. Every Sunday is a special day. Every Sunday is the first day of the week that we can come together, seek the Lord together, and then leave and serve Him together. What a wonderful crowd it is to see each and every one of you here. I'm privileged to serve as the interim pastor for the Great Eastside Baptist Church. If you're not a member of a local church, then this is the place for you. There's no other place near this place, just like this place. This is the place for you to come, to serve, to worship. This is the place for you. Amen. A few of them woke up and said, yeah, amen, I'm, I'm agreeing. But listen, as our guest today, we're honored that you're here. We have a special little gift we'd like to give to every guest that's here today. And it's a cup of remembrance, a cup for you to remember that there's a fellowship that cares about you and wants to fill that cup with joy and love and, and laughter. And so go by our guest desk following the service and get your gift. And as a way of us saying thank you for being here today. Now, I would like to ask you to do this for me. I would like for you to stand. And as you stand, uh, would you turn to the person in any direction of you, side, front, back, and just say, you are looking good. I'm glad you're here. Would you do that for me? <laughs> you're looking good. Hey guys, y'all are looking sharp today. You're looking good. Amen. Jesus Christ is risen. And because of that, he frees us from the chains and the tomb that we find ourselves in. And this song we're going to sing just celebrates our risen Lord and what that means to us today. What a glorious day when Jesus sets us free. Amen. I was buried in me, my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I Amen. I was dreaming, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met you. You call my name
All right, this might be your testimony this morning. celebrate our risen Lord today. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that he loves us in spite of ourselves, mm -hmm. that he knows all about us, and yet he still loves us. Mm -hmm. He loves us to the point that he would die for our Thank sins. You, but, Lord, we praise you that you did not stay in that tomb, That's right. that, Lord, on the third day you rose and that today you are alive so that we might have everlasting life. And Father, we just praise you for that. We thank you, Lord. We pray you would have your will and way in this service today. And as we continue singing your praises, as we hear your word preached, may we honor you, our risen Lord, in all that we say and do. Yes. Amen. We're going to stand and sing some great hymns of the Easter season. Christ the Lord is risen today. Let's sing it now. Christ the Lord is risen today. Mary. 
let's sing that first verse again. Just our voices as praise unto the Lord, celebrating our risen Lord. Let's sing it together. Give our Lord a praise this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. The word Easter literally refers to the time of year in the spring when the days become longer than the nights. But for the person who knows Jesus Christ, Easter means a lot more than that. It means that even though Jesus died, salvation didn't. Even though Jesus was buried, hope wasn't. Because Jesus is alive. Easter means there is forgiveness for my failures, grace for my guilt, and mercy for my misery. Easter means that the pain and the silence of living in a Saturday world isn't purposeless and it isn't permanent. Easter means that I can't out the grace of God and I can't outrun the reach of God. It means that Jesus is King, light overcomes darkness, and justice will win, and brokenness will be broken. Easter means that the scars on the hands of Jesus are telling a story of victory, not defeat. And the same is true for me. It means that I am not alone, not ashamed, not forgotten, and not forsaken. It means that the rain and the storms and the wind and the waves of this world will not have the last word because my future is a resurrected body with the resurrected Jesus on a resurrected earth. Easter means that I can join with a choir of saints and angels singing, Oh death, where is your victory? Oh grave, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your song? Easter means that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for me. Easter means that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. Can somebody say amen? amen. Can somebody say pray the Lord? Praise How about somebody shout glory? glory? Glory to God for our risen Lord. Amen.
gets excited <laughs> take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to John the Gospel of John chapter 18 John chapter 18 this morning I want you to take a walk with me to the garden A number of years ago, we were able to have a little place that had enough property to make a garden. And uh, my father had long since passed away, but growing up, that was his pride, that was his joy, his garden. That was his hobby. To me, it was slavery, <laughs> but to him, it was his hobby. And we always had everything in a garden that you'd want, the squash, the peas, the butter beans, the tomatoes, the corn. I mean, I can still see him dragging his heels along as he's dropping the seed and his heels pushing the dirt over the seed. So fast forward a number of years and I was able to have my first garden. <laughs> and uh, I have to admit I was quite proud of my garden. The corn actually came up, and the tomatoes hadn't died, and things were growing, and the corn was probably four or five foot tall, and every afternoon when I'd come in from the church, I'd just admire my garden, and already the mouth was watering and salivating just thinking about the cornbread and peas and fresh corn, and I'm making you hungry, aren't I? <laughs> Hurry up with this sermon, preacher. Ah, uh, but the best is still to come. And um, an afternoon storm came in. I mean, 
It turned dark in a hurry. The winds I thought was going to rip the roof off of our home. Hail fell. It was a horrific thunderstorm. It passed. Sometime later, I walked out and I, I caught a glimpse of my garden. I was crushed. I was stunned. I was broken. Because there, those rows of corn were laid completely down. It was beaten. You know, sometimes life doesn't seem fair. You try to do the best you can, and still the thunder rolls. Storms come. And though while maybe not in a real way like that, there are a lot of emotions and things going on inside of us that find us this morning in the same kind of way where the storms of this life have laid us low, beat on us, and left us hurting. Well, come take a walk with me to a garden. In John chapter 18, verse 1, we read, Then Jesus spoke these words, he went out from his disciples over the brook Kedron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place where Jesus often met there with his disciples. For our brief few minutes as we come to this garden, I want you to consider first with me what I would call this garden of trouble. All four Gospels mention this garden. Well, what took place? What happened in this garden? The Gospel writer Matthew says, Then Jesus came with them to a place, the garden, but the garden had a name that Matthew took note of, and it was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here a while, I go and, and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here. And watch with me. If we were to ponder out over this garden of trouble, we would understand why perhaps Matthew recorded it and named it the Garden of Gethsemane. For it was a garden of olive trees. And every year when the harvest would come, they would take the olives off of the trees and they would put them in a press. And the press would go round and round as they poured the olives in. And the press of the, on the olives would squeeze out the olive oil. The Gethsemane just means press of oil. So in this garden, we must not overlook what happened on that day when our wonderful Savior, our darling, the darling son of the Lord God himself, when he went into this garden, immediately he felt the press. He felt the weight of our sin. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray and have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I will never be able to understand that kind of press but I do understand what that press was. It was the press of your sin and my sins, all of all the ages that were before us and of all the ages that shall come. All of our sin was gathered that day on the Lord and he began to feel the press, the weight 
of our sin. But as we take a deeper look into this garden, not only must we see the press, the Gethsemane, but we must look at what Jesus said was the cup. Mark records these words, and then they came to a place, the garden, which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he said in his prayer, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. When we stand here in this garden of trouble, it would be enough to cause all of us to pay attention to the press of our sin. But now you hear Jesus describing in a, in a sense that I now have a cup. No, he did not perhaps have one literally, but it was the cup I, uh, that Ezekiel the prophet said in Ezekiel 23, thus says the Lord God, you shall drink of your sister's cup, the deep and wide one. You shall be laughed to scorn and held in derision. It contains much. Thus says the Lord God, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back, therefore you shall bear the penalty of your lewdness and your harlotry. There he was in the garden of trouble, already feeling the press of our iniquity. And now he beholds a cup a deep and wide one, as the prophet would say, that would contain much. Mm. He held a cup of the totality of man's wickedness and God's wrath. He looked into the cup, and he who knew no sin was now staring, holding something, that in his humanity he said, take it away. But in his deity he said, nevertheless, thy will be done. It was a garden of troubled. Peter said later, he who himself bore our sins in his own body. What a troubled garden this is. But as we stare ever so humbly into this garden of trouble. Not only do we see that press of Gethsemane and the, and the cup of agony, we see his sweat, his weariness, his agony. Luke records coming out, he went out to the Mount of Olives, the garden, as he was accustomed, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation, and he was withdrawn from them about a, a stone. So when he knelt down and prayed and saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And verse 44 says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became as great drops of blood falling to the ground. Oh, it was a garden of trouble. This condition, doctors say, is hematidrosis. I believe that's how you say it. But what it is, it is caused when a person is suffering such extreme levels of stress that they literally will bleed through the pulses of our own body. There is the Lord in this garden of trouble, in such agony. The rains of rebellion were falling hard on him. The rains of sin weighed him down. The winds of wickedness pressed him to the ground. The forces of the storm strained him to sweat drops of blood. The word agony means it was a wrestle. What was our Lord wrestling with? Well, in Ephesians, the Bible said he did, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. That was what he was wrestling with that day. In the garden of trouble, he wrestled against principalities, against powers. Could we ever imagine that all of hell and its demons were standing with every force they could push, trying to push down Remember, it was the demons who immediately knew who he was, though man didn't know him. Ah, we know who you are. You're you're the son of God. And they had a moment. They thought they could seize him and press him down and scrub him away. It was a garden of trouble that he wrestled with that day. But it was this. It means alone. It means Weakness. He struggled alone. No one else could bear it. No one else could understand it. No one else could endure it. You see, they borrowed a bed to lay his head when Christ the Lord came down. They borrowed the coat from him to ride to town. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. And he borrowed bread when the crowd he fed on the grassy mountainside. He borrowed a dish of broken fish from which he satisfied. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. He borrowed the ship in which he sat to teach the multitude. He borrowed a nest in which to rest. He never had a home so crude. But, but... The crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. He borrowed a room on his way to the tomb, the Passover lamb to eat. He borrowed the winding sheet. But the crown that he wore and the cross that he bore were his own. In 1932, Charles Wiggle wrote these words. Since I found in him a friend, let me tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so kind and true, I would tell you how he changed my life completely. He did something that no other friend could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for you, for us all. But... From the garden, I take you a little further to another garden. Walk with me to this garden. In John chapter 19, in verse 41, we read, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. And so there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. I call this the garden of triumph. I can't walk to this garden without first going through the garden that we just mentioned, the garden of trouble. But oh, how I can rejoice and stand before you today and not only talk about the garden of trouble, I can talk to you about a garden of triumph. Luke said, now on the first day of the week, early in the morning, there were certain women that came to the tomb bringing spices that they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, and they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth. They said to them, well, the angel said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but 
is risen. Yes, hallelujah. He's not here. He is risen. The son of God. Then he said, he is not here, but he's risen. Remember, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified and the third day rise again. Don't you remember? Four times Jesus said to those disciples that for, on those early years, in those latter days of his earthly ministry, four times he said to them, as he said, one, after Peter testified that Jesus was the Christ. You remember? Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? And Peter made his confession that thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And then in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16, from that time, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and be raised from the dead. You see, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Again, he told his disciples after the transfiguration, in that glorious moment where Jesus went up to the hillside and he, he brought Peter and John with him. And in that moment, the Lord Jesus met with the prophets, Moses and Elijah, and they had a great fellowship. I can imagine what that must have been like. There was a holy glow of God. And immediately the disciples were brought to their knees. Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus turned to them, commanded them, telling them, tell this vision to no one until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. It is a garden that Jesus talked about before the garden of trouble. When at the transfiguration he met him, but also while they were on their way, passing to Galilee and on their way to Jerusalem, again Jesus said and, uh, that he was about to be betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. But I remind you what Jesus said as he said to his disciples, I, my father, will lose nothing. You see, that all, all they could think about was a loss. But Jesus taught them it's not a loss, it's a gain. Well, I guess there is a loss. You lose the weight of your sin. You use the guilt of your sin. You use the condemnation of your sin. I don't mind losing those things. Because of the garden of triumph, I understand. I stand in this garden. I say to you, he is risen. I serve a risen Savior. He's coming again. Hallelujah. I serve a risen Savior. And on that day when they went to the tomb, thinking that they were going to prepare him for his death, they were introduced to the living, risen Savior. In fact, when the guard of death made his rounds that morning through the cemeteries of the dead, he cried out, he's not here. When the schoolmaster of the dead called roll that morning, Jesus was absent. Pain said, he's not here. Sorrow shouted, he's not here. All tears said, he's not here. And grief muttered, he's gone. Hallelujah, I serve a, we, a risen Savior. To the women of sorrow, the angels asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. You see, when you visit the Garden of Easter, you must not stop at the Garden of Trouble. You must move on to the Garden of Triumph. History records an interesting thing. When Wellington was battling Napoleon, Napoleon's effort to conquer the world, and they descended upon the people of London, at the Battle of Waterloo, all of London fell in fear. And from a sailing vessel out in the south coast of, the England, of England, a semaphore signaled the news of the battle to a semaphore atop Winchester Cathedral. And when he began to signal the message for all of London to see, a heavy 
fog dropped in. All they saw was the semaphore signaling, signaling Wellington. Wellington. Our beloved English Wellington. Defeated. And the fog settled in. Can you imagine the disappointment, the fear, the dread that fell over them? That was the last word they had. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. Soon the winds picked up and soon the fog lifted. And to their amazement, the semaphore was still signaling. And they began to read his signals. Wellington! Defeated. Napoleon. I can see on that eventful evening on Friday afternoon where all of hell gathered around as they watched our beloved Savior buried in that grave. And they stepped back and said, Yes, he is done. And they danced that dance through the corridors of hell saying, It's over, it's finished, all men are condemned forever. <laughs> oh, no. For on the third day, God sent out a message. Christ is risen. And he defeated, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Oh, my beloved, this morning, walk with me in this garden. Back to present day. I was, I guess, visibly upset at my little garden the corn laid over it was a pitiful sight one of my deacons at church said to me oh pastor don't worry I said well, why I mean look it's laid down <laughs> he said no no in a few days the sun will lift your corn back up You walked into this room beaten, broken, down. But I have some good news. The sun can lift you up. Can lift you up. Yes, there was a garden of trouble. But oh yes, there's a garden of triumph. He is risen. And I ask you to bow your heads with me. And as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, let me take you just a step further. There is another garden. When Christ was being beaten embarrassed as he had been drug off stripped mocked and spit on his beard was plucked out while all of that was going on one of his disciples named Peter was standing at a guilty distance and a woman said to him one of the servants of the high priest whose was a relative of the man whose Peter had cut off his ear she said did I not see you in the garden did I not see you in that garden this morning you're at the garden. Do I not see you at this garden? What will your answer be? Will you deny him? Or will you delight in him? Will you curse him? Or will you confess him? Will you turn away? Or will you this morning turn to in humility Turn to him 
in repentance and rejoice that he suffered that he died that he defeated death for you Father in these dinner moments thank you for letting us walk through your garden thank you It still crushes me. It still boggles my mind how you would do such, endure such for me, for us. Yet, because you loved us, because you were willing to take on our judgment, gave yourself thank you Lord Jesus for suffering for me and whatever number of days I have left on this earth help me from this day forward to serve a risen Savior My friend, this Easter could be your garden experience. This could be your time when you realize what he did for you and how he desires to live triumphantly in you and through you. And to give you all the hope and the peace through all of the days ahead. And because he lives, I will live as well. If you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe for the first time you understand what he's done for you. Would you confess him this morning? Would you turn to him this morning and say, yes, Jesus. I'm beginning to see that you can raise me up. You did it with such compassion and such love, but yet such power that no sin can hold me down. No sin can keep me back. Thank you, Jesus. And sitting here this morning, I confess my sins to you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Cleanse me. Renew me. And from this day on, I will serve you Till the day you come for me or call me home. And thank you. Thank you for being my risen Savior. The journey begins now. In this fellowship of believers, take your stand. Begin the journey and walk with him talk with him, fellowship with him. No sweeter moment, no greater moment, for no other moment is guaranteed but this one. Come to Jesus and let the risen Savior cleanse you, call you, claim you as his very own. Oh, this is the moment. So what do I do? Brother Delton, well, when we stand, you can start and make your way to this front. Let us pray with you. But it's your journey. And stand and let this group of fellowship, this group of people, this fellowship, stand with you. And together, lift him up, honor him, serve him. Perhaps you're looking for that church fellowship. No greater day than on Easter Day to join with to say, I'll work, I'll serve, I'll stand with you. And let's together lift up our risen Savior. Maybe you just need to come to this altar and do some business with God. 
Maybe you've been following him at a guilty distance. Maybe your fellowship is not as sweet as it once was. Now's the time to change that. Now's the time to start. And it can all start when we visit the garden. Let's stand and as we sing, make your decisions known for Christ today. Come, I'll meet you here. to be here today and you came as a result of somebody inviting you anybody raise up your hand I, I'm just curious anybody here look at her I see hands over here over there awesome thank you so very much what a blessing it is to see every one of you here today and in fact again turn to the person who's on either side of you and say you blessed me by being here today you blessed me by being here now by the way, church, uh, it's just, just getting started. We serve a risen Savior. And until he calls us home or comes to get us, we're still in business. And our business is to let people know that Jesus loves them. And I pray that when you walk out this building, you get into your vehicles, it will just overwhelm you how much he loves you. That he would go to the garden. Amen? Yes. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to, well, I guess Brother Ron's going to sing us out. Okay. Can you do that? I could do that. He's going to, well, we'll all sing together. We'll be on our way till next Lord's Day. Let's sing it. Praise God from I need to slim up some.